Wow. Here we are. The last Soprano log. When I set this goal for myself at the beginning of this year, it seemed like such a distant target. 86 episodes across seven months. It seemed almost impossible at times that I would end up hitting that number. And yet here we are. It's been an incredible journey. My channel has grown so much during that time and it's thanks to all of you. So I guess really there's only one thing to say in this situation and that is All right, you know I had to make that joke. But seriously, thank you guys so much for watching. It has been so much fun reviewing my favorite series of all time with you guys. This community is amazing. And I hope you guys have been enjoying the videos so far. There's going to be a lot more great Sopranos content to come. And I hope you're all looking forward to that. Now, I know the question on everyone's mind is probably, when are you going to start the actual review, asshole? But for those of you with a little bit of patience, um, I wanted to address the second most common question, which is, what am I going to do next? Um, a lot of people have been asking me to review another series, just like I did for The Sopranos. And the two most common suggestions I get are either Breaking Bad or The Wire. Well, I'm happy to say that I'm going to be reviewing both series. Um, now, I don't want to take up too much time in this video specifically, so I've linked a video in the description of this one. It's a follow-up where I go through in detail all of my plans for the rest of this year, as well as next year. All of my plans for the channel, what types of content I want to do, everything like that. So once you're done with this video, go check that one out. But without further ado, let's get into the review. This is Made in America, the series finale of The Sopranos. Enjoy. As I mentioned before, this is one of only two episodes to be directed by David Chase himself. He directed the pilot and he directed this episode. So he really gets to bookend the series and give it his own directorial touch. We open on a shot of Tony that makes him look like he's almost in a casket. That's not the only connection to death that we're going to see in this episode. Tony then goes to meet with Agent Harris. And there's this great detail that Harris is arguing with his wife on the phone because he's always working and not at home with her. And this really humanizes him, and it draws a connection with Tony, in that they both have family problems that they're struggling with. Tony then asks Harris if his contact knows where Phil Leotardo is holed up. Tony offers some more information about the Arabs that really doesn't make a difference, but Harris says that he does not know where Phil is. Tony then goes to see his family, who are staying at an old house that Carmela has bought to flip. And I noticed that this house is actually on the shore. Um, and that obviously reminds us of the house that they were going to buy on the shore, Whitecaps. Now, Tony wanted that house to be closer to his family, but in kind of an ironic twist, right now, even though they're on the shore, they're more distanced than ever due to the war that's looming over their family. Meanwhile, Butchie talks with Phil on the phone. Phil is really upset with Butchie personally that Tony isn't dead yet. Butchie suggests that they maybe try making peace, uh, but Phil refuses to do that. After the call, Butchie looks up and he sees these wandered from Little Italy into Chinatown. It's a great visual metaphor for the fact that following Phil has led Butchie astray. We also get a little bit of dialogue uh, from this tour that says that at one point Little Italy was this huge neighborhood, but now it's been reduced to just a couple blocks. And again, just like we saw in the pilot episode, one of the constant themes of the series is the fact that the Italian identity and the mafia identity is kind of on the decline. And that's one of the issues that causes Tony's depression. Tony then goes to see Janice uh, to visit with her now that her husband is dead. Janice complains that she receives no gratitude from her family who are wanting to move out and away from her. And we can see that Janice is becoming just like Livia. And in fact, later on, Janice goes to see Junior to tell him about Bobby's death. And Junior, suffering from dementia, thinks that she's Livia. So again, we're seeing that connection between mother and daughter here. However, Janice is just trying to find out where Junior's money is holed up. Um, but unfortunately, he doesn't know where it is. 
he's lost all memory of that. As Tony is leaving, he gets a call from Agent Harris, and Harris tells him that Phil is somewhere in Oyster Bay, Long Island. They tracked him down um, to a payphone there. Now, Harris slept with another agent in order to get this info, and we're seeing just how far he'll go for Tony in this circumstance. Tony then calls George Paglieri, a mobster from a different family than the Lupertazis. George arranges a sit-down with Tony, Paulie, Butchie, and little Carmine. Butchie agrees to a truce with the Sopranos, after all, Phil was kind of threatening him, and they agree to make restitution to Janice for Bobby's murder. With peace achieved, Tony and his family go back to their normal routines. Carmela then sees Meadow hanging out with Hunter. Now this is the first time we've seen her since season 3. Hunter was apparently kicked out of college for partying, but is now on her way to becoming a doctor, and Carmela is resentful of the fact that she's going to be another independent woman when Carmela is kind of stuck with Tony, and she starts acting very coldly to her after that. The Parisis then come over to the Soprano house to celebrate Meadow and Patrick's engagement. Meadow has decided to join Patrick's uh, criminal law defense firm, and later at dinner with Tony, Meadow says that she decided to become a lawyer after seeing how the feds persecuted Tony. And we can see that Tony is clearly disappointed that Meadow is going to live her life defending guys like him. She's kind of chosen to believe the lies that Tony told their family about being persecuted. When we learned earlier that Tony really wanted his daughter to get away from this life and wanted her to become a doctor and do something good with her life rather than defend criminals. However, we also learned that Carlo's son Jason was arrested on drug charges. And when Carlo disappears, they learn that he's agreed to testify in order to protect his son. Now, Carlo knows a lot of damaging information, and Tony will almost certainly be arrested and indicted because of this testimony. With Carlo gone, Tony offers Polly the captain position over the April crew. Polly declines the offer, though, believing that it's cursed, since every captain that's held that crew has either died or disappeared. However, when Tony says that he'll give it to Patsy, Polly agrees to take it. Now, let's talk for a minute about the cat. Uh, the guys find this cat at the safe house and decide to bring it back with them to Satriali's afterwards. Now, a lot of people think that this cat is actually Adriana reincarnated again. Adriana was always associated with cats throughout the show. Uh, she sings this meow song during the Massive Genius episode. She wears cat prints throughout the show. And when she's killed, she's seen crawling around like a cat. The cat in this episode also stares at Christopher's picture, which seems like something Adriana would do. Now, there's one problem in this theory in the fact that they refer to the cat as a boy. And because of that, some people think that the cat is actually Christopher, but I don't really think that that's true. I mean, why would Christopher be staring at a picture of himself? I mean, maybe he's that vain, but it seems like more likely he would be trying to scratch Tony or Polly, but it, the cat is actually pretty passive. And it's also possible that the guys, you know, don't really know how to gender a cat and just assume that it was a boy. So while I'm, you know, not set on this theory personally, I do see a lot of uh, information here to connect it to Adriana. Meanwhile, AJ has decided to join the army. He wants to do something about the terrorists, and he thinks that, you know, this is the way to, you know, improve life here in America. It's funny, too. He says he wants to be Trump's personal pilot, and all of these references get funnier to me over time. But Tony and Carmela don't want him to go, and instead, they kind of bribe him. Uh, with this film job working for a uh, little Carmine, they also buy him a new car after his SUV is destroyed in a fire. And so in this way, they're able to control him and keep him from going to Afghanistan. Meanwhile, Tony's men find Phil at the gas station. They shoot him in the head, and his wife is there and then runs out of the car to go, you know, attend to him. However, the car is still moving, and the wheel ends up rolling over Phil's head and crushing it. 
it's this really disgusting wet noise and it takes away the last bit of dignity that Phil has when it comes to his death. Now when Harris hears about Phil's death, he blurts out that we're going to win this thing. This is a reference to uh, Lindley Del Vecchio, uh, who was an FBI agent and a handler of the uh, famous informant Greg Scarpa. Just like Harris, DeVecchio was accused of giving information to the mob and kind of favoring one side over the other. Um, so that's the reference here. After this, Tony goes to see Junior in the mental home. Now this is the first time that they've seen each other since the shooting. Tony goes to him and tells him that if he remembers where his money is, it should go to Bobby's kids, not Janice. Uh, but like I said, Junior can't remember where his money is, or anything about the Mafia. However, he does remember playing catch with Tony, and Tony starts to cry when he realizes that Junior is lost forever. Even though he had all of this resentment for Junior because of the shooting, he's truly realizing now that he's lost his family member for good. However, in some ways, Junior is kind of the lucky one in this circumstance. Tony said in the season one finale, if you're lucky, in the end you'll remember the good times. And Junior only remembers the good times. He doesn't remember all the horrible stuff he did as a part of the Mafia. Um, he only remembers playing catch with Tony. And again, like I said, Junior always loved Tony. He thought of him like a son. And this bit of dialogue here is just reminding us that despite everything, Junior really did love Tony. We now get to the final scene of the series. Now, you all know what happens here. It's the most famous ending of any TV show. And when I started doing these videos, I told myself I wouldn't do a video on the ending. There's just so many explanations on YouTube already. However, since we're here, I'll go ahead and give my reasons why I believe Tony dies. The cut to black represents Tony's consciousness ending. Now, this episode uses the ringing of the bell on the door to signal that we are cutting to Tony's POV. This shot style was also used in Soprano home movies when Tony hears the bell on the dock. It also cuts to his point of view there. Also in that episode, Bobby says you probably don't even hear it when it happens. This was repeated to us again last episode, and when Jerry Torchiano was killed, Silvio also does not hear the shot. Now, the guy in the members only jacket connects to the first episode of this season. Eugene wore that jacket when he assassinated someone in a restaurant, just like this. Also, Tony was shot in that episode as well. When he passes Tony in the restaurant, we see the house from Mayhem on the wall. And like I said in my Coma Dream video, I think that house represents death and the afterlife. The bathroom that he comes out of is also at Tony's 3 o'clock, just like Christopher's dream of hell. Going to the bathroom and getting a gun is also a reference to Godfather when Michael Corleone uh, shoots his father's killers, which incidentally happens to be Tony's favorite scene of all time. Then there's also the case of Meadow, who is not there at the time of the shooting. Many people think that Meadow is Tony's guardian angel. She saves him from being shot in the college episode, and also she takes the FBI's bug from the house uh, during the season 3 episode, Mr. Regario's Neighborhood. The fact that she was not there during this final scene leaves Tony vulnerable. And so, for all those reasons, it's clear to me that Tony dies at the end. As for who kills him, we don't know, because Tony will never know. The ending is so tied to his consciousness that we can't know anything that he doesn't know. Now, Butchie is the obvious choice. The peace that they agreed to might have just been a ploy to leave him vulnerable for assassination. It could have been one of Tony's men as well. They were getting pretty sick of him by the end of the show. Now, Paulie looks pretty upset about something after he gets the offer of the April crew. Maybe he either knew what was going to happen or was setting it up. We do know that Paulie contemplated betraying Tony in the past. It's possible it was little Carmine. I have a whole video where I talk about, you know, his role and the fact that he might have been pulling the strings on this whole thing. But ultimately, though, it doesn't matter to me. Regardless of what happens, the ending itself is so brilliant. 
we're still talking about it to this day. It's memorable, it's well thought out, and it completely subverts our expectations. It's also a great contrast to the ending of season one. The ending of that episode was so warm, it was this great family moment, but season six has been so cold. AJ also references this episode uh, when he brings up Tony's advice to remember the good time, but Tony himself does not remember this. We're seeing just how far Tony has fallen emotionally. But that really is the episode. I can't believe it, but we're done. What an incredible journey. When we started this series, Tony was a bright-eyed and happy man. We fell in love with his complicated charm. But after season after season, conflict after conflict, Tony has been left a bitter, lonely, and doomed soul. Never before have we seen character development like this. This really is the greatest television show of all time, and I am so grateful we had the chance to experience it. And after following Tony for six seasons, as he gradually destroyed everything he ever loved, there's only one thing left. Where is the motherfucking goddamn orange peel beef? I know I say this every time, but I seriously cannot thank the patrons enough. Not only do you guys support me monetarily, but a lot of you have gone above and beyond in helping me with these videos, in helping me with the Discord, and my channel would not be where it's at without all of you. So today I'm going to be including everyone who's a patron regardless of the tier, because no matter what, you guys are all a part of this video. Papa Diablo, Tommy Smith, Abdallah Alamari, Russell, Sean, Joey Lee, Graham, Elliot, The Original Gamer 79, Yuval Karen, Meister Anchor, Final Boss Blues, Joseph Klein, Claire Walker, Heart of Markness, Eduardo Mendez, JJW Menzoon, Mitch Boer, Ivan M. Hidalgo, Broccoli, Dara Gallagher, Stephen Lillard, Matthew Casolo, Placenta Juan, Logan, Hef SD, Chris F, Geo, Roland Pitts, Miguel Amador, Shu Hao Lee, Clean, Big O, Ryan Ellis, Alex Clancy, John Reyna, Jose, Hatter Dadder, Jesse Sterling, Andrew Stewart, Ops Gracing Media, Steve Kemp, Conchok Chofel, Austin Blanchard, Daz J Kit, Dirty Harry, Peter, Verinder Singh, Clyde Frog, Timothy Payton, Dante Hicks, Conan Higgins, Michael Petrescu, Elizabeth Ellis, Emmanuel Ward, Ian Rittmaster, Benny Fazio, Margo, Irish Nachos, Binary Unit, John Morris, Per Strom, Darko, Patrick Kapisak, Averhuger123, and Brendan Medlin. I apologize if I mispronounced any of your names. I'm not used to pronouncing some of them, but seriously, thank you all.